Good morning for those who are, of you that are watching this webinar live. Hello for all of you who are watching the recorded version. Uh, my name is Jordi Anton, Head of Pediatric Rheumatology Department at Hospital San Juan de Deu. I'm Professor at the University of Barcelona, Spain, and Chair of the Education Working Group at the on Rita. I would like to welcome to this webinar, How do I treat monogenic SLE and interferonopathies of the ENRITA webinar series, Lunch with Rita. It's my pleasure to co-chair this session with my good friend, Christoph Norman, he's chair of ENCA and courier, and also REPAC representative, the group of association of patients and families inside of ENRITA. For those who are following this session live, more than 200 people are registered. Please, be, uh, we will have questions at the end of all the talks. Remember, you can send your question right in through the chat. Christophe, would you like to introduce our first speaker? Yeah, thank you, Jordi. So our first speaker is uh, Michael Posel from um, Remalis uh, Patient Organization in Austria. He is a father of uh, young girls at uh, the Lepus, and uh, he will share with us, uh, yeah, uh, the problem of everyday life and all the the questions and um, things we have as uh, patient um, families. And uh, he's also a member of the REPAG organization inside RITA. So it's uh, yeah, it's my pleasure that uh, having a testimony uh, in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Christoph, and uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Michael Pölzel. Um, I'm very thankful that I'm uh, able to share with you this uh, short patient, patient perspective uh, on this very interesting talk today. Um, I am uh, part of a support group in, in Austria called Rheumalis. Uh, we try to support children and young adults uh, with all kinds of rheumatic diseases uh, and also their families, of course. Um, we uh, try to be there whenever they need us, or uh, we also have a very active um, community uh, that's like a self-help community where uh, people can exchange um, their tips and tricks, which is always very helpful. I'm also a patient representative uh, in REPAC, which is the uh, patient representations within ERNRITA in the pediatric rheumatology stream. Um, but today I'm really here to talk to you um, as a father of, of an eight-year-old child. Um, our daughter, um, when she was five years old, was uh, diagnosed with uh, systemic lupus and nephritis. Um, it's hard to put across how traumatic um, this can be for a family. Um, with the initial uh, sort of time of uncertainty, um, the long hospital stays, uh, sort of the ups and downs of the diagnostics, um, uh, the suffering, and then finally um, getting a diagnosis, which interestingly uh, or uh, probably um, quite understandably is a huge relief because after all these uh, weeks of uncertainty um, it's, it's finally uh, great to have uh, a final diagnosis to say okay this is it it's SLE it's nephritis we can uh, do something about it uh, we can start the steroids which are hugely effective uh, and uh, reduce the symptoms very very quickly so there is this initial period of huge relief um, <laughs> which is then quickly followed by um, the horrors of, uh, of doing internet research on any of these topics. Um, as we all know, if, if you start going down that route, um, there are lots of things that you read about which is very negative and it gives you uh, probably a very skewed uh, view on the topic which is really unhelpful uh, at this time. And luckily we were able to uh, contact uh, a few support groups, uh, also the, the group I'm working for now, Reumelis in, in Austria, um, that really helped us to get a much better perspective uh, on, on the disease uh, and what it really means for daily life, what the, the general outlook is, and just speaking to um, other parents who have uh, children uh, in, in a similar situation. It's not easy to find them, um, childhood onset SLE, is a, a rare disease and, and it's not easy to um, get in touch uh, with people because they seem to be um, distributed all over the globe uh, but luckily also with the internet uh, and being able to 
um, get into some support groups also abroad. Uh, we've managed to build up a, a really good network of, of uh, parents who also have uh, children with uh, SLE. Um, so that has helped us a lot um, over time, um, over a space of two, three years, uh, our daughter has slowly uh, improved. Uh, and also with the medication, of course, uh, we managed to get into a stable period now. Um, she is uh, pretty much in remission at the moment and we have uh, managed to build up a good support network at the hospital also. Um, so we are in a very good place at the moment to um, just continue with life and, uh, and just manage each of the challenges that are thrown um, occasionally in our path in a much more informed way, in a much more relaxed way, um, uh, without the um, sort of panic that we had at the start, which is hugely uh, helpful to um, uh, treat her condition, but also just the psychological state uh, of, of her and also the entire family uh, is, is much improved for it. So uh, we're very grateful to all the people who um, helped us on the way. Um, we also had time to educate ourselves, um, obviously on the disease and what it means, uh, just medically, also in, in the wider, more practical uh, contents. And, and often, obviously, uh, although it's, it doesn't really affect the treatment as such, uh, we wondered uh, where it did come from and, and also whether uh, genetics uh, might play a part in this. Um, and for us as a family, this is uh, particularly interesting because our children um, were adopted uh, at the age of a year and a half uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, our daughter has also a twin brother um, and we do not have any family history uh, at all uh, on them. So we don't really need know any of the medical history uh, of their parents, etc. So um, the genetic, genetic involvement is, is definitely something that we've heard about. Uh, I don't think we've done any diagnostics on it. And for us, uh, it would be very interested to see if this is something that might be interesting or might even uh, be helpful in the treatment. So um, I'm very interested uh, in the talk uh, and also very thankful uh, that there is uh, ongoing interest uh, in, in research into SLE, especially for, for children, uh, as it's uh, quite a rare uh, thing. And uh, as a family and also as a, as a support group, we are really encouraged that new therapies and medications are looked at um, all the time, uh, which hopefully will make the quality of life uh, of our daughter and, and other uh, children in her situation uh, better. That, that's really our great hope. Um, and just to, to close this uh, short overview, um, just my, my personal heartfelt thank you to, to all of you uh, giving these talks, but also listening to these talks um, and taking some time out of your busy schedule uh, really to try and help um, children like our daughter um, with, uh, with her disease. It's very much appreciated and really makes a difference uh, to us moving this forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. I mean, for your testimony, that's also important because in the end, with the, the patients and their families when they are children is our focus. So uh, for us, your testimony, your experience also enriches us and helps us in our work. And it's a clear uh, motivation for our next, next talks. No? And the first speaker we have this morning is Alexander Belo. He is the head of the Pediatric Rheumatology Unit at the National Reference Center for Rare Juvenile Rheumatism and Systemic Autoimmune Diseases, RACE, in Lyon, France. He has a research group at INSERM and works on managenic causes of autoimmunity. He's a great physician and a, a fantastic friend also. And for me, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce you. Alex, the floor is yours. So thank you, uh, Jordi, for the for the introduction, and thank you, Michael, for the the great talk. Just before reminding that uh, we need to find treatment in patients. That's the main uh, one of the main issue. There is a long journey before the diagnosis, and we'll discuss about this uh, during this uh, this topic. So can you see correctly my slide? Yeah, we can see it. Cool. So here is my disclosures, and I'm really happy to to introduce. So first, what what is a lupus? And as you mentioned, Michael, it takes a, a time often before we get the diagnosis. And we should say, as a clinician, that uh, 
the, this is not a unique disease. There are several different form and subset of lupus, and each case is probably a, a unique case in some extent, and it can affect uh, the skin, the kidney, uh, the joint, the CNS, and uh, all the, the, the different organs. And um, the genetics is part of this disease in some patients. It's probably a, a very rare issue. We estimate that uh, about 10% of lupus starting uh, uh, in children childhood is related to single gene mutation. And why we think about this? <clears throat> it's uh, first because there is an aggregation of families with the, when you have a single case, there is a 10% uh, of, of situation where you have a second, first degree relative which suffer, suffer from lupus as well. Um, if you look at this uh, ratio, lambda S, which has the disease frequency in sibling over the disease frequency on, on the population, SLE is a, one of the highest uh, level for this, uh, this uh, score which estimates the, the impact of genetics in the development of the disease. And here, this is the, the global um, vicious circle that we have in, in monogenic lupus. So it's not only in monogenic lupus, actually it's in probably in all systemic lupus, where there is this um, first uh, increase of apoptotic bodies, release of DNA material, nucleic acid that will then uh, prime the innate immune uh, system with this uh, recognition of nucleic acid and the, the production of large amount of interferon. Interferon, this is an antiviral cytokine that is uh, highly increased in lupus and other connectivitis, uh, which uh, in turn is capable to induce activation of T and B cells to make uh, some production of autoantibodies against different targets and organs that will uh, then form also immune complex with the circulating nucleic acids that will then deposit in tissue and uh, bring some new cells, dying cells, apoptotic bodies, and uh, it uh, increase the, the, the activity of lupus. If we think about genetics, um, it's a long time that it was supposed to be genetics in some situation, including the complement deficiencies and the first description went to the 70s. Uh, but if you look at this uh, scale, so there were some description of the uh, Icardi Gutierrez syndrome, which is a familial disease, a neuroinflammatory disease associated to large amount of interferon, and some of these patients display and develop later on lupus phenotype. But as you can see here, there is a break, and it restarts in two, uh, uh, 2003 with the discovery of interferon. Oops. And um, the role of, uh, of TREX1 as the first gene associated to this entity and a couple of new genes discovered uh, till now with the NGS uh, uh, amendment. And uh, you see here so many new genes that have been described in lupus, all of them being unrelated in some extent in different pathways. So in this very busy slide, you can see uh, the different pathways and the different uh, genes and the possible drugs that can modulate this uh, specific activation. We will just give an overview during the next uh, half an hour with uh, Marie-Louise. So I start with the complement and, and Neto's defect, which is this first part, uh, just to highlight that um, every day we have uh, 10 billion cells that are dying, totally silent, for the immune system, because it's uh, un unrecognized, uh, it's uh, the, the, they get phagocytos by the immune system, by the macrophages, and this uh, removal of these self antigens is uh, normally not inducing any inflammatory response. But in case of def defect of these key molecules that are on the left, you can have an, an increase of. Uh, of uh, interferon, increase of self um, nucleic acids that will promote the immune uh, system and activation. 
So for the complement deficiency, the older uh, genetic uh, lupus, uh, it can be due to any of these molecules associated to classical or MBL pathway. But the, it represents probably in kids around 5% of all SLE starting before the age of 18. And uh, it's uh, more penetrant when you have a C1Q deficiency. It's around 100% of C1Q deficient patients that develop a lupus, uh, which is less the case for C4 and less the case for C2. This is essentially autosomal recessive disease. Here it is an illustration of a young girl that we screened for by wall exam sequencing. She started very early in the first year of life, a rash. Uh, she was negative for double strand DNA, which is often the case for complement deficiency. And um, she gets some, some benefits to be treated by JAK inhibitors. But uh, the JAK inhibitors in her case was a, a bridging therapy uh, for the bone marrow transplantation. And she gets a bone marrow transplantation, and uh, she's now well and cured for, from the disease. So for complement deficiencies, um, so these molecules are essentially synthesized by the, the liver, except for C1Q. And uh, fresh frozen plasma infusion can be an option, uh, but you need, in that case, to treat patients daily with a fresh frozen plasma because there is a short half-life of the, 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 the complement. And there is a theoretical uh, risk to develop C1Q antibodies in that case. Belimumab has been also uh, reported in some uh, cases. And then uh, bone marrow transplantation represents an option. As I mentioned, C1Q is also produced by monocyte-derived DC, mature DC, meaning that by the bone marrow transplantation, you can cure the patients. And the problem of complement deficiency, it's not only autoimmunity, it's also recurrent and severe infection. And in this uh, short report, I think there is a, around five to six patients with C1Q deficiency that get transplanted. Uh, one get a severe uh, GVH disease and died. Two developed uh, post-transplantation uh, lymphoproliferative disease which means still that it's uh, challenging to treat the patient with this uh, strategy. Another thing is this DNAs 1 or 3 deficiencies that have been recently recognized. So DNAs 1 or 3, it's an ex extracellular nucleus that digests the nucleic acids uh, within the, the apoptotic bodies. And um, the phenotype of the patients, it's a systemic lupus, some of them having this uh, McDuffie syndrome with the uh, hypocomplementemic urticaria and vasculitis syndrome. The kidney disease is very frequent. Uh, they are positive for double strand DNA, but also for ANCA, which is not common in lupus. And uh, it used to be a severe case. We looked to the interference signature of this patient, and depending on the activity of the disease, we can see it can be I can go down to normal values depending on the activity of the disease, which is different from the canonical type 1 interferonopathy. So our understanding is that it's um, close to complement deficiency in some extent, and there is an increase of netosis and uh, an increase of self-nucleic acid outside the cells that will uh, um, stimulate the TLR pathways. And for this reason, we realize it's very challenging to treat these patients. And uh, in the literature, there are a few reports, but we should say that conventional immunosuppressants or JAK inhibitors have been tested. But the, in, in our experience, it doesn't prevent you to go to, to severe, severe disease, including uh, end-stage renal disease, uh, meaning that it's very challenging. And for these patients, we need some new treatment. We are aware that recombinant DNAs 1 and 3 uh, is um, um, on the way and there could be an option and a really targeted therapy in this patient. So we have a lot of hope for, for this specific treatment. And also, all treatment that will target the, the TLR recognition and signaling that can block the, the signaling of uh, uh, this, uh, this recognition 
as I mentioned, this nucleic acid in excess comes from the extracellular compartment. Um, another situation, here we are on a metabolic disease recently described, the SAT1. It encodes for a spermidine, spermine acetyltransferase, this is an enzyme involved in this polyamine metabolism. And when there is a defect in SAT1, it's uh, um, hemizygous mutation, it's boys only. Uh, there is uh, this, uh, this lupus phenotype that occurs. And um, as for DNA 1 and 3, as for complement deficiency, it's related to the uh, defect of netosis and the accumulation of extracellular nucleic acids. And probably in that case, DNA 1 and 3 recombinant that help to digest the nucleic acids outside the cells could be an option, and MYD88 as well. There is no demonstration that this treatment can, uh, can be useful uh, today but it's, uh, it's uh, in the future, maybe. Um, I jumped to the interference signaling and nf kappa -B signaling uh, or activation to illustrate the, um, the fact that when you produce cytokines induced, uh, including interferon, uh, there is this cascade under, upon the IFNAR uh, heterodimers that will signal via JAK stat and ultimately activate the interference stimulated genes. And uh, it's well regulated. We have some natural inhibitors of this uh, cytokine uh, um, signaling, including SOX1. And SOX1, um, I know Stefan L, Frederic Rioloca have worked uh, with, on these specific genes and all the jack statopathies but i illustrate this with one case of a lupus boy who went with the sox1 um, hit when we screened by raw exome sequencing his genome it was predicted pathogenic and uh, not seen in other uh, database but first the the brother and and the father were unaffected and carrying the variant so in that situation we are less excited in this genetic finding thinking that it's probably um, not causal. But another family uh, pop up with the two kids, two daughters, with the um, one with lupus, the other one with the um, immune thrombocytemia. And um, when we look in details to the, to the segregation, uh, the aunt was affected by a, by a multiple diagnosis, granuloma, psoriasis, uh, spondylarthritis, lupus. The father was a carrier but not affected, except he has an interference signature. And the, the, the brother has this psoriasis that I didn't anticipate it could be linked to interference, but it is actually, as uh, some psoriasis can be. Psoriasis, if you have treatment by a recombinant interference, you can have a full psoriasis that developed. So that's, uh, uh, that was known in the past already. So together with, uh, with our colleagues, we found a couple of additional families. And what is important here is to say that SOX1, it is our natural JAK inhibitor in, inside our cells. It is induced by the cytokines and it will inhibit uh, the, the JAK stat signaling via both JAK and stat inhibition actually. And it's probably the most potent JAK inhibitors we have in our cells. So as we find these sort of uh, anomalies, it's uh, uh, quite easy to think that for these patients, we could uh, use the JAK inhibitors and treat the patients. So just this is the illustration of the psoriasis in the, 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 the brother, who was um, a psoriasis quite dif difficult to treat initially. When using a JAK13 inhibitor with tofacinib, the, the improvement was partial. But when we use a JAK1 and 2 inhibitors, uh, we went to, to total remission, showing that after a long journey of different therapeutic strategy uh, with this specific treatment, it works very well. We go to a, another signaling pathway, which is the, the, the NF kappa B pathway. So there are two different uh, um, way to activate NF-kappa-B, the canonical pathway and non-canonical pathway. 
for the canonical pathway, it's essentially due or linked to uh, different uh, cytokine receptors that will go to this uh, AIKAKA complex uh, that ultimately activate NF kappa B. And it's again, we have some natural inhibitors here, such as uh, A20 encoded by TNF AP3. And um, when you look in details to this uh, APO insufficiency, A20, it's uh, essentially a pseudo set phenotype, usually. But if you look in details in the literature, and there is a recent review of all published cases that has been done by, by my colleague Sophie Georges Alavial, around 10% of the A20 APO insufficiency have a lupus phenotype. And in that case, and thinking about the pathway that are activated, um, all the anti-cytokine will be useful, including first TNF blockers, but also IL-6, IL-1, and, and possibly calcineurin inhibitors or JAK inhibitors. A few patients get a bone marrow transplantation uh, with more with the with improvement and also cure the disease depending on the severity and probably the response to cytokine inhibitors as we will probably all start with a cytokine inhibitor. I will end my presentation um, with this last part of the immune tolerance management. So I, as I mentioned in this vicious circle there is the activation of both T and B cells that is also critical for the development of lupus and some specific checkpoint can be mutated and drive the lupus phenotype. One of the most, uh, if not frequent, because it's rare, maybe more um, um, easy to understand, it's this deficiency of PKC delta. It's a molecule that is expressed in B cells at the time of the, the differentiation, and uh, you, it's a proapoptotic molecule that we find in this family with the three affected kids, and it's critical for the selection of um, these transitional B cells. At that step, we remove the autoreactive uh, B cells. When the cells go outside from the bone marrow, they are called transitional, but they have not reached the lymph node already. And it's around 30 to 40 percent of these B cells that are still autoreactive, but they are purged at that time. And if you encounter the self antigens, you undergo these cells undergo. Um, a clonal deletion. But if the, it depends on PKC delta. If you have not PKC delta, you have um, the persistence of these self reactive B cells uh, over time. The phenotype can be even syndrome. Um, actually, all of the patients, even with even syndrome, they have double strain uh, DNA or at least antinuclear antibodies and some features of lupus, uh, such as the rash, which is very frequent. Uh, in some patients, it can be even a pseudo skid phenotype with a recurrent and severe infection that can start early in life. And we understand this defect as uh, if you have a total deficiency of PKC delta, it's more related to an immunodeficiency phenotype. While when there is a small level of expression, you essentially present with an autoimmune disease. We made the map carrying the G510S BLLIC mutation that recapitulates the lupus phenotypes seen in our patient. And um, as you can see, the, 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 the affection is very severe and lethal, but we were capable uh, to, to change the situation because we realized that in that case, uh, upon the BCR activation, there is a, an increase of the AKT mTOR signaling in mice, and that could be treated by rapamycid mTOR inhibitor. And using mTOR inhibitor, we were capable to, to restore uh, at least the lymphoproliferation and reduce the kidney inflammation. I think, meaning that in that patients, uh, um, mTOR inhibitors are really useful. And probably in a lot of B and T cell driven um, lupus, the mTOR inhibitors are really useful. Another way to represent this is this Noonan syndrome. So, as you know, as a pediatrician, Noonan 
syndrome is not so rare. One out of 2,000 uh, live births. Uh, the genes which is most frequently around 50% of Noonan syndrome are due to this PTPNL mutation. And there is the facial dysmorphia features, heart defect, short stature. And um, we recently screened patients with the no specific familial antibodies. Normally, it's a dominant disease, so you can get diagnosed from the parents. But uh, we, we went to um, a wall exam screening of uh, early onset GSLA with a short stature, and we found uh, this variant, PTPN11, which was de novo, that appears uh, in the kit and was not present in, in the parents. And uh, so that was the, the final diagnosis, and it's associated to lupus. Autoimmunity is quite frequent, around 50%, but the lupus itself probably one to five percent of Noonan syndrome is more it's less frequent but uh, in any case um, here there is an interesting review that has been published uh, this year on all the possibility to to target uh, this NRACE carase pathways using MEK inhibitors here of or for PTPN11 encoding for SHP2, it's SHP2 inhibitors themselves or mTOR inhibitors, as you see here. And uh, the, the field of these drugs is growing and growing, and probably within this TB cells activation related to rhizopathy, uh, a number of new drugs are, are coming up in the future. Another challenging situation still in T and B cell development, is this transcriptional factors defect. When the transcriptional factors defect uh, are present, it's often associated to a part of immunodeficiency with the low immunoglobulins, um, low B cells, but T cells can be totally normal, even if you develop a lupus phenotype. Here, it's not on lupus patients, but it's the experience in IKZF1, Icaros mutation that get uh, a bone marrow transplantation. Three of them are still alive, but one uh, died very early from a severe infection of the liver. And um, as usual, bone marrow transplantation, whatever it's C1Q or um, transcriptional factor defect, when it's diagnosed late in life, it's more challenging to make the the, the bone marrow trans transplantation, essentially for infectious uh, uh, um, reason. I will just finish my presentation with some hope regarding new therapy and, and uh, cell-based therapies such as CAR T cell strategies. Just two weeks ago, a very nice paper, I'm sure that all the fans of autoimmunity have seen this manuscript, which is really fantastic. Um, it was related to uh, CAR T cells in autoimmune disease, not only lupus, but also systemic sclerosis, inflammatory myositis. But here, if we focus on the lupus, eight lupus patients treated, five of them started the lupus uh, before 16. So it was juvenile SLE. Um, the cytokine release syndrome was mild and only occurring in three out of eight patients. And what is really striking, it is that all of them, all of them are off medication without any immunosuppressant and steroids with a slate eye of zero. There is no more DNA, uh, double strain DNA. And uh, I think we, the, 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 the authors recently celebrate the first patients with uh, uh, 1000 days without any treatment, meaning that maybe for the first time, uh, lupus could be think about a, a sort of curable disease uh, without long-lasting treatment. In this uh, study, they didn't explore the genetics of patients, but even if it's monogenic, I, personally, when I see the heterogeneity of expression and uh, penetrance, I suspect that doing a reset of the B-cell compartment could be really useful even in some monogenic lupus cases, and I, we have some hope uh, regarding these strategies. So having targeted our personalized therapy, it's definitely the future. Personally, I think we should screen all the, the, the GSLE patients for genetics, as it could help us to, to decide the, the best treatment. And we have mentioned the, 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 the bone marrow transplantation, 
mTOR inhibitors for, for TB cells deficiencies. And in the future, a lot of new drugs are coming up. And I will leave um, Marie-Louise explain uh, uh, what we can do in lupus associated to type 1 interferonopathies, as she has really experience in this. And it's uh, also a, a field of increasing interest with some targeted uh, therapies. And I will leave you, uh, um, Marie-Louise, discuss your, uh, your own uh, talk on monogenic interferonopathy. Thank you very much, Alexander, for this uh, great talk and overview about uh, monogenic lupus. I think it's an amazing uh, uh, field of knowledge. And we have a great speaker. I mean, as you said, Marilis, uh, area of research and experiences, interferonopathies, uh, sting disease, has a lot of publications and working in, on this kind of, of diseases. She's a pediatric rheumatologist at Janis Grove Lab and the Imagine Institute at Necker Hospital, uh, Paris, France. And it's a great pleasure to have you here today, Marie-Louise. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jordi, for this kind invitation. It's really my pleasure to be with you today at this lunchtime. And, uh, and I'm very pleased to speak after Alexandre <laughs> exceptional uh, presentation about the genetic lupus and also uh, the experience um, uh, shared by Michael of the, the journey for the patient. So today I will focus on really rare uh, genetic disease uh, associated with type 1 interference signaling. So these diseases are, are called type 1 interferonopathies. They have been coined by Jan Nikro, that is the world expert on this disease, already uh, more than 10 years ago. And so they are uh, genetic disease, Mendelian inherited, uh, that are associated with a constitutive uh, type 1 interferon um, pathway activation that leads to auto-inflammation. So I'm uh, showing you again the slide um, that you have seen in Alex's presentation. And so these monogenic diseases are either due to an excess of nucleic acid uh, sensing, so on the, on the left of the screen, or a defect in the regulation uh, beneath the IFNAR uh, receptor. If we try to classify them like in, with the, the clinic and also the pathophysiology, probably we can see four uh, different subgroup in this disease. The first one is the, the most uh, emblematic, is the ecardi gutierrez syndrome, already known uh, by clinicians for uh, 40 years. This is a disease that mainly affects uh, the brain and the skin, and uh, all the uh, proteins that are mutated in this syndrome are involved in nucleic acid metabolism and they represent um, a genetic uh, defect of disc discrimination or removal of soft nucleic acid uh, versus um, uh, foreign nucleic acid. And uh, Alex mentioned you the first uh, gene described in uh, this ecardi uh, Gutierrez syndrome, that is the TREX1. The second group of disease uh, with SAVI and COPA syndrome, they are more systemic uh, disease. The neurological involvement is really rare. Uh, this patient uh, presents with really severe systemic inflammation, uh, skin vasculopathy, uh, intestinal lung disease. They can also present joint and kidney uh, inflammation and sometimes have a lupus-like feature or even all the criteria for SLE. In this case, uh, the disease is due to mutation that leads to a constitutive activation of sting signaling. That is a protein that is involved in cytoplasmic DNA um, recognition. The third group uh, it would be the PRAS or candle that are uh, auto-inflammatory disease with high interferon due to dysfunction of the immune uh, proteasome. Uh, this patient uh, present with a very specific uh, phenotype, as you can see on the slide, uh, with lipoatrophy. Uh, they can also have chillblains, high uh, inflammation, and uh, they don't have uh, much um, autoimmunity and SLE, uh, as uh, we know so far, since these are a rare disease. And the last group more recently identified uh, by uh, the CRO, uh, our group, but also by other researchers, uh, are mutation in the TLR pathway 
in TLRs invoked in nucleic acid uh, sensing, such as TLR7, that is a monogenic cause uh, of lupus. And so this patients are in between, I would say, the genetic lupus and the interferonopathy. So biologically, they, are, uh, they have a high interferon uh, score, they have high interferon signaling, and we can uh, show in vitro that their mutations are associated with high interferon signaling. As for the, the phenotype, they look more like uh, a classical lupus or sometimes just a, a chilblain-like lupus. So I think with these two uh, presentations, you can see how these diseases can uh, sometimes overlap and this also have implication in terms of treatment. So knowing that uh, there are too much interferon signaling in these genetic defects that were really virtually uh, uh, with no treatment until 2014, the idea uh, came um, to use JAK inhibitors that are able to inhibit JAK1, that is uh, one of the kinase used by the interferon receptor, that is the IFNA receptor. And so, uh, the, in particular, the Rafala Goldman Mansky group at the NIH and also other groups in Europe and France, including uh, uh, my unit in Necker and also the team of Alexandre Bello, tried this treatment in this genetic disease. But just before going to uh, more details, I want just to give you some um, some data on this JAK stats pathway. So, as you probably know, uh, JAK was named after being just another kinase after, for example, TIC2 uh, description. This pathway can uh, transduce the signal of more than 60 ligands, so they are really important pathway in our cells. In humans, there are four JAKs and seven stats. And so uh, two uh, jackinas will combine and use uh, two different stats to transduce the signal of these uh, numerous uh, cytokines. So actually, when you, you think about using a jack inhibitor, you would uh, like to inhibit just one uh, jack kinase and maybe just one association between different jack and stat, but we'll see that this is not uh, really the case. Uh, this is just a list of uh, the approved marketed JAK inhibitors uh, across the world, and they may have some difference uh, between continents, and this is important when we think of this rare disease that can happen, uh, of course, anywhere uh, in the world. And here uh, with this, uh, the, this slide, I want to show you how these targeted uh, therapy are not so targeted, because when you use JAK1 and 2 inhibitors such as ruxolitinib and baracitinib, you don't only inhibit type 1 interference, but also many other cytokines and uh, other proteins important, such as growth hormone, EPO, TPO. When you think that you're using a targeted uh, therapy using JAK1 and JAK3, again, you will uh, inhibit a lot of things, including the gamma C family cytokines that are really important for T cell uh, development. There are now development of more targeted JAK inhibitors, such as JAK1 inhibitors, and also uh, some TIC2 inhibitors are, um, are under development. So what is our experience, our international experience on the use of these JAK inhibitors in genetic interferonopathies? There is probably an organ-specific response. If we look at the skin, we, we can see really a, a good remission of the chilblain lupus in these uh, TRAX1 deficient patients. Uh, here you have some uh, slide of the experience of Rafaela Goldbanmansky of the NIH where she observed an improvement of the lipoatrophy in the candle patient, also an improvement of the severe vasculopathy seen in this savvy patient uh, that was really disabled. And um, as uh, uh, Alexandre mentioned, there can be psoriasis associated with high interferon signaling, and uh, we were able to put uh, one uh, psoriatic lesion in remission uh, under um, Ruxolitinib. Regarding the brain, uh, that is really the main organ affected in ekd syndrome, this is really different and more difficult to assess. 
I share with you the story of his family uh, with one brother having classical AGS due to RNH H2B mutation. His little brother was completely unaffected at uh, four months and started on ruxolitinib. Unfortunately, he became symptomatic at the age of 14 after a period of fevers and then ex experienced uh, neurological decline. As uh, we know, uh, it's the, the main phenotype in Echider in Gutierrez syndrome. Interestingly, when we look at the interferon alpha level uh, in, her, in his CSF and serum at the beginning of the treatment, when he was completely unaffected, he had a really high score, uh, uh, interferon score and really high uh, interferon alpha level in the CSF and in the serum. So that probably the disease was already ongoing, even if it was clinically and radiologically asymptomatic. The other uh, important point of our experience is, is that the level of the ruxolitinib that we measure in the plasma uh, were really higher than in those measured in the CSF. So there is a problem with the, the brain penetration of the drug. We uh, published last year our experience on uh, 11 AGS patients uh, treated with JAK inhibitors. You can see on the top right that we were able to uh, uh, decrease their uh, blood interferon score. However, when uh, we look at the, the effect on the brain, uh, we were less convinced. We were able to... Um, to uh, improve their AJ score, but only the vocalization was symptomatic, uh, significant, sorry. And very importantly, there was no difference in the poly handicap score. And we also uh, did a caregiver assessment, uh, which was really uh, innovative and interesting. And only uh, the patient comfort was improved according to the, the caregivers. So the main challenges for treating the uh, CNS inflammation in AGS are the difficulty to assess treatment and that probably we start the treatment when there is already established brain damage. And we would need a rapid diagnostic, a better uh, brain penetration and also good uh, clinical and biomarkers. And this may be interesting when we think of uh, the um, possible neurological involvement in, uh, in lupus that can be uh, also challenging to be treated. Regarding the systemic inflammation that we can see in this uh, disease, JAK inhibitors are usually very efficient. Regarding the, the lung uh, that can be affected uh, essentially in SAVI and COPA, uh, we, uh, we and others observe a decrease of interstitial lung disease. However, this treatment did not prevent onset or progression to lung fibrosis and uh, some patients uh, underwent, underwent a lung transplantation despite uh, being treated with JAK inhibitors. Uh, before uh, going to other therapeutics that can be used in this disease, I want to highlight the potential numerous side effects that we can see with this treatment knowing also that we use really high dose of JAK inhibitor in this genetic disease, so that actually we, we reach a pan-JAK inhibition with any, uh, any of uh, this drug. So uh, we and others have observed uh, numerous infection and quite importantly, also invasive bacterial uh, infection, probably because we inhibit uh, IL-6 uh, signaling uh, with this drug. We observed few cytopenias. Other uh, concerns uh, are about the possible withdrawal uh, syndrome when the drug is brutally uh, interrupted because they, they are so much activated of the pathway that if you miss one, uh, one uh, dose, this can lead to really a cytokine storm. Uh, and uh, we uh, also observed pulmonary hypertension and uh, thrombosis in one patient. And the main uh, question for us as pediatrician is the long-term um, uh, 
uh, side effect of this treatment because I told you there are genetic defects. Some patients have been already treated for 10 years. So what will be the future for these uh, children treated with so many years uh, by JAK inhibitors? I will move to another uh, therapeutic approach that is the idea that uh, our self nucleic acid um, deriving from retro elements are the cause uh, of, the, of the disease. And indeed, uh, endogenous retro elements that account for 40% of our genome, human genome, so this is a lot. Uh, so these endogenous retro elements can have the ability to replicate and they have been implicated in several uh, mutations associated with Eckardi Gutierrez syndrome. So, with this uh, in mind, uh, Yannick Crow and Stefan Blanche trialed the use of three uh, retrotranscriptase inhibitors that usually are used uh, in HIV infection. Uh, and they treated 11 patients for 12 months. And uh, this was a proof of concept study looking at a biological um, effect. And indeed, the interferon score decreased upon treatment as the interferon alpha protein level in the CSF. And so this was really a proof of concept that it is working biologically. Uh, the, the question whether it can be useful on the clinical aspect is still uh, unknown. And I will end uh, the, my talk with the anifrolibad that has been really a hope for the genetic uh, interferonopathies. As you know, uh, this treatment uh, is approved uh, uh, in the state and Europe for the treatment of SLE. Anifrolimab is a monoclonal uh, antibody targeting IFNAR, um, that is so the, the unique receptor for type 1 interferon. So there are uh, some experience of the use of atiflimab in genetic interferonopathies, in particular in the group of Rafaela goldman mansky at the NIH. She uh, treated uh, 12 patients with good efficacy. So as you can see on the, uh, um, um, on the left, bottom left, sorry, there was a decrease of CRP, ECR, interferon score, and most patients were off steroids under afnifolimab, and the treatment was well tolerated. Few other patients started anifolimab, inclusively uh, in uh, Europe, and uh, one, one uh, case report has been recently uh, published with, uh, again, uh, good efficacy and tolerance. Probably anifrolimab could be an option to combine with a few uh, doses of baricitinib or ruxolitinib to have um, the better um, uh, block blockade of the older inflammatory process involved in this patient. So in conclusion, I think uh, for this disease that uh, were uh, really unresponsive to conventional treatment until 2014. We have a lot of hopes with the JAK inhibitors and now uh, with anifrolimab and maybe other inhibitors specifically for, for example, Sting or TLR. But there are many concerns about the, the JAK inhibitors uh, effect, side effects. I want also uh, to highlight that there, there are issues with access to these targeted therapies worldwide. In some countries, uh, there, there, there is no access to JAK inhibitors, even when a genetic interferonopathy is diagnosed. And um, I mentioned you that we need novel therapeutic option and also think about uh, intratecal delivery uh, to uh, better treat uh, CNS inflammation. With this, I really thank you for uh, your attention and thank uh, all the patients and family and all uh, my teams and collaborators. Thank you very much, uh, Marie Louise, for this wonderful talk. I mean, I think it's Again, challenging and um, opens a lot of doors for questions and uh, for promising treatments in this type of patients. Um, we have a few minutes for questions and uh, while uh, the audience is sending the, their ones. Um, as a clinician, I have a few questions for, for you. No? Uh, the first one for Alexander. No? I mean, considering that there are people that are following this webinar, uh, who are maybe not in a reference center, 
which will be your uh, comments or your protocol of study for uh, monogenic lupus in uh, patients with SLE. I mean, we, we listened this morning, uh, Mitchell, uh, 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 doubts or, or, or uh, questions about that, no? So uh, do you believe that nowadays all patients with SLE, because as professionals we know, not those who are younger, those who are family members, but do you think we are in the time to study all of our patients uh, with lupus for monogenic um, uh, forms? Thank you, Jordi, for the challenging question. And I mean, we, are just, we have no demonstration that uh, um, a treatment only driven by genetic defect is more efficient than a conventional treatment. And I should add on the top of this that uh, even recently, personally, we get a lupus nephritis in a girl suffering from NLSC4 gain of function. We were very surprised about this phenotype. And we decided after a lot of discussion to treat as other lupus patients. So we have not anticipated anything specific for NLSC4 because for us, it doesn't make sense in terms of biology. But this is very specific. Uh, but globally, I think, yes, we don't treat C1Q deficiency as other lupus. And DNAs 1 and 3, which are very challenging, in the future, we will have specific treatment. So we are just in the middle, in the gray zone, where I'm sure in the, in the next future, we will treat the patient differently when you see the genotype. But we, are, we have today no demonstration. I think the RITA community is maybe the good place to start to think about something personalized, specialized, and there are these CPMS meeting where we can discuss challenging case and uh, globally um, make the effort to think collectively what is the best for this specific patient. And we should probably set up something around challenging case in lupus with the genetic defect. And, and uh, I would be interested, but I'm sure a lot of other colleagues could participate and, and drive this discussion. That's, uh, uh, that's a very interesting point and opens for the next question to Maria Luis. Maria Luis, uh, do you think there is uh, in this personalized, ideal world that uh, Alexander uh, is, is saying and, and you that work in one of the main groups or the one, if not the, the main group, at least in Europe, about interferonopathies, uh, which is your practice? Are you selecting or you can uh, define a specific signatures for all the different uh, monogenic lupus? I mean, we could use this lupus, uh, use interferon panels, no? Do you think we can just select different signatures with only a few genes that can help us to uh, choose which JAK inhibitor, for example, or which combination? Or we are still in a gross mode instead of directly Select ones. Um, thank you, Jordi. Another very challenging question. So about the interference score, I think it's our experience and also Alex's experience. Uh, I don't think that there is uh, some IEG that are more uh, specific for a genetic interferonopathy as for a lupus. I think then the level of the score can be different. Usually when it's a genetic interferonopathy, the the levels of the interferon score are really high and they are high uh, and if, well, regardless of the treatment, even in the case of JAK inhibition in SAVI, for example, the interferon score remains elevated. Yeah. Uh, then I think there is more and more clinical overlap uh, between these diseases. Uh, when we talk about C1Q deficiency, for example, they have high interferon score. When we see all this mutation in the nucleic acid associated TLR pathway, TLR7, UNC, um, 93B1, uh, clinically there is nothing to, to say this is a genetic lupus, this is a genetic interferonopathy. In a way, I don't think this is so important. I think the good mm -hmm. point, as, uh, as Alexandre mentioned, is to pick up the one that has a genetic defect because this has implication for uh, genetic counseling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for treatment, um, uh, for the, the, the follow-up that you can uh, imagine for this uh, patient. Mm -hmm. 
We have another question from you, Maria, for you, Maria Luisa, from Dr. Sejin. Uh, thank you for this amazing presentation. Would you recommend any antibiotic or antiviral prophylaxis along with JAK inhibitors? So, uh, uh, in, uh, in monogenic disease, I think we have to be very careful because uh, we have been using really high dose of, uh, of for example, baracitinib, and we have experienced several uh, uh, severe in, uh, invasive bacterial uh, infection, including uh, meningitis and uh, pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So in this patient, they have to be really well vaccinated to all uh, encapsulated bacteria, uh, but we don't uh, give them antibiotic prophylaxis uh, unless they have a severe uh, skin or uh, lung lesion, uh, where they may, may have a, a a place for a uh, bacterium corticromazol uh, prophylaxis. Uh, no antiviral prophylaxis. Uh, zoster is a, is a concern, but if we can vaccinate the patient before initiating the drug is one option. And uh, the other option is to treat if there is a VZV or uh, infection or zoster uh, reactivation. Thank you very much. I think I lost my camera, um, but still you can hear me. Um, uh, it, we are almost done. Okay, here I am again. We are almost done. Uh, just a, a final question, and as you finish your talk, Alexander, about CAR-T, um, uh, how do you consider, I mean, uh, uh, nowadays, how we can select this kind of patients? Uh, we are talking about monogenic lupus, interferonopathies, in which point uh, of uh, their disease pathway, we can suggest this therapy for these patients. I mean, I think lupus is for every clinician a B cell driven disease. But when we started with this rituximab clinical trial, it was so disappointing <laughs> that everything was negative, negative, negative. And then when you come back to genetics, you realize that the more frequent monogenic cause of lupus, it's not linked to B cells. It's essentially due to innate immunity defect, including type one interferonopathies, including complement deficiency, DNAs one and three. So this is really puzzling. But with the CAR T cells, I think it's totally new. And re re I think it's a reboot for everyone thinking that if you reset the B cells, which are at the end of the chain, it's the, the, the way you are activating and doing tissular lesions with the antibodies. When you reset the B cell compartment, it seems to be really uh, powerful to, to, to block the disease. And as in some disease, I don't think C1Q deficiency is a good candidate, but uh, maybe DNS1 and 3, or uh, some dominant uh, disease that that show an incomplete penetrance. In these patients, I think the, the harmful antibodies comes from the environmental factors. And if you block this or you reset the B cells, maybe new B cells upcoming in a different situation won't be so harmful and maybe you have cured the disease, even if it's genetic. So uh, there is a lot of discussion around this. It will be fascinating, but it's a full of hope for all patients, including those with a genetic defect. Thank you very much. I believe this is a, a good effort, this a wonderful and amazing, challenging webinar. There is a lot of hope, as uh, Alex said. Uh, uh, Christoph, I don't know if you want to say some words. Uh, just to thank you all the, the presenters for the nice uh, talks and uh, Michael for his testimony. And uh, yeah, it's uh, nice to see, as uh, Michael said, uh, that uh, there is a lot of research done in all this field, uh, even if it's rare disease, it's very important for our kids and for the families. So thank you very much for all this. Thank you very much again to the speakers. Thank you very much for all of you who are following on live or this recording webinar. And don't forget, every month, lunch with Rita. See you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.